I'm Jan Banker here in Blackburn Chapel and welcome to our worship this week. I'm really excited that sometime soon we might be able to be back here together, but until then, know how much I miss you and I feel your presence with us. And you know that we can't take our offering because we're not here tonight, but you can take it up to Bahama Place on Wednesdays from 2 to 4 and you can put your offering in the offering plate up there in the rotunda, or you can put an envelope in my cubby. And of course, I'm here again with Sybil. She's now the regular accompanist, and she'll be playing the prelude and hymn and the benediction. I'm very grateful for her music, and I know you are too. And behind the scenes is her husband, Bill Hall, doing the videotaping, and I'm very grateful to both of them. So Sybil will be playing on Eagle's Week. Our reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, selected verses. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed 
day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. These are the sacred writings of our Christian faith, thanks be to God. And now Sybil will play one verse of the hymn, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart, and we have the lyrics for you so it's easy to sing along. wasting away and our chronic stress levels are high with the social distancing, no visitors and health worries brought on by this pandemic, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. So I hope that you do not lose heart, although it's certainly understandable that any of us, staff, residents, family, might have moments or even a day here and there where we might have lost heart, be discouraged. My science background spurs my fascination with microbes, pandemics, viral contagions, so I've been devouring every ebook I could find on those topics at the public library. I do remember a course I took my last semester in college on parasites, where we learned how you get parasites, how they invade your body, and what they look like under a microscope. For my college graduation present, my grandmother took me on a trip to China, and on the way we stopped in Tokyo to visit my family's exchange student, Yasuhiro. On the way to his home for a traditional Japanese meal, my grandmother lectured me that the one best manner rule I absolutely had to follow was to eat everything that was served to me. So when Yasuhiro's mother served us raw eel and other types of sushi, my stomach immediately felt queasy. One of the most disgusting looking parasites I'd studied in my parasitology course lurked unsuspecting in raw fish. No matter how repulsed, I knew I couldn't use poor manners and offend my grandmother and host. I grabbed a bite of the raw meat with my chopsticks, closed my eyes, popped it in my mouth, and swallowed. She gave me a very slightest nod of approval as I struggled not to gag. Who would have known that in 2020 we would all be familiar with the shape of the microscopic novel coronavirus, spikes and all, and would be learning a lot more about biology, including evolutionary biology, than we'd ever expected. But life is biology. So it's always had this sacred link to me with faith. I was actually a biology major, but I took as many religion courses as I possibly could. And I treasure that John's gospel relayed that Jesus described himself using biology language. He described himself as the bread of life, the resurrection and the life, the way, truth, and life. But simply because of a microscopic virus, life and death are in the balance for thousands around the world and for several millions, the threat of sickness and financial disaster loom large. Pandemics and the pathogens that cause them have shaped fundamental aspects of what it means to be human. From the way we reproduce to the way we die explains Sonia Shaw in her book, Pandemic, tracking contagions from cholera to Ebola and beyond. Pandemics and pathogens shape the diversity of our cultures, 
the outcomes of our wars, and lasting ideas about beauty and about our bodies and their vulnerability to the pathogens of today. Their powerful and ancient influence informs the specific ways modern life provokes pandemics. Disease is intrinsic to the fundamental relationship between microbes and their host. And by the time our earliest ancestors, the first multicellular organisms were clambering out of the sea 700 million years ago, microbes had already been colonizing and ruling the planet for nearly three billion years. They had penetrated into every available habitat. They lived in the sea, in the soil, and deep inside Earth's crust. They could tolerate freezing temperatures to boiling ones, and they fed on everything from sunlight to methane gas. Microbes colonized the pores inside rocks, ice cores, volcanoes, and the depths of oceans. For the microbes, the human bodies were like BOGO luxury high-rises on a ritzy beach, and they had a heyday. Microbes laid out their beach towels on our smooth skin and carved out beautifully landscaped linear parks in the lining of our guts. And they tried out their own little science projects, mixing their genes into ours. They quickly had squatters' rights, and not even high-paid lawyers could successfully evict them. Our bodies were soon home to 100 trillion microbial cells, outnumbering human cells 10 to 1. But with swagger, Homo sapiens developed an impressive arsenal of weaponry to surveil, police, and destroy microbes. We shed layers of skin to rid ourselves of the microbes that want to run year-long summer camps on our arms and legs. We constantly blink our eyelids, not to be coy or annoying, but to wash microbes off our eyeballs. With I'll show you bravado, we concocted the perfect recipe for a bacteria-killing stomach brew of hydrochloric acid and mucus, which was much more effective than putting up a do not enter sign for the marauding microbes at the entrance to our stomachs. Every cell in our body develops sophisticated methods of protecting itself from microbial invasion, but we didn't stop there. We knighted specialized white blood cells as our homeland security, and they roved speedily through our whole bodies, never taking coffee breaks or eating Krispy Kreme donuts in their patrol cars, alert, armed, ready to detect, attack, destroy microbe enemies. Our impressive 24-7 immune defense is a test to the ongoing lethal threat of microbes. To survive, our bodies had to be finely tuned to fight contagion. In the lingo of biologists, this readiness for battle is costly in terms of the allocation of resources, particularly oxygen for fuel. And still, we are obviously not impenetrable. When our immune defenses are weakened by age or disease or exhaustion, Microbes invade our cells and wreak havoc like it's a play date and no parents are home. The novel coronavirus replicates with giddy abandon and trashes our lungs. And if that wasn't fun enough, they have pillow fights in the heart and kidneys. And the more our homeland security gets spread thin, the sicker the patient gets. So it's no wonder that we might lose heart might be worried about catching this virus and getting sick and sent to Bayfront Hospital, no visitors allowed. We call these culprits pathogens, and in the case of COVID-19, a virus. But they are all just microbes, relentlessly doing what they always and anywhere try to do, feed, grow, spread. In an ideal situation when they can go Gangbusters, they double their numbers every half hour. They never age, as if long ago they went on vacation to St. Augustine in Florida and discovered the fountain of youth. 
microbes live forever, as long as they have enough food and unless some external factor extinguishes them. That's why the flurry to create effective antiviral medications for our current pathogenic usurper. How do we not lose heart? As this COVID doesn't seem like a momentary affliction, but rather stretching even into next year. And it doesn't seem to be preparing us for anything worthwhile at all. Pathogens and their victims are in this continuous survivor reality show with each side evolving even more sophisticated ways to crack the other's defenses. This has led experts to realize that epidemics are not necessarily contingent on specific historic conditions at all. So even if no one in the world enjoyed eating wild bats or chimpanzees, preferred hosts for coronavirus and Ebola, even if airplanes did globe trot and squeeze passengers together like this, <coughs> and some unknowingly incubating a deadly virus, even if nursing homes all had single rooms with private bath and one dedicated caretaker per resident, we'd still have plenty of microbes around to give us quite a scare as they effortlessly spread like wildfire. Pathogens and their hosts are locked in this endless cycle of epidemics, Sonia Shaw writes in her book, Pandemic. Far from being historical anomalies, epidemics are a natural feature of microbial life. We live in a microbial world, always have, always will. People live longer and better now, though, than at any other time in history, but not even scientific advances can keep up in real time with a fiendish new kid on the block virus. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. Martin Buber wrote, to be old is a glorious thing when one has not unlearned what it means to begin. In their book, Pilgrimage into the Last Third of Life, the authors pointed out that by the time we reach the last third of our lives, most of us know that life holds no certainties for us, for our families, for our society, or even for the planet. They suggest seniors re-envision aging as a pilgrimage in ourselves as pilgrims, acknowledging the limited nature of time. Then every moment brings an opportunity to experience God more fully. Whatever and whomever we encounter, each moment of each day becomes an encounter with the holy, an event that can transform us. How could we let this pandemic transform us day by day? If you worry during this pandemic that your age or particular health situation makes you easy prey for this obstreperous virus, you may lose heart. If that happens, I urge you to reclaim the treasures of your Christian faith through this passage from 2 Corinthians that grounds us in the promise of resurrection. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus. The resurrection transforms everything, even a modern global pandemic for this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. We are resurrection people, renewed day by day despite pathogenic, contagion, health worries, and no face-to-face -face visits with family and friends. Our hope is in the unseen, in God's renewed purpose for our lives at this daunting moment in history. Let us pray. Gracious Savior God of endless encouragement and love that bears all things, continue to help us persevere through this slight momentary viral contagion that seems endless and increasingly problematic and divisive. Help us not to lose heart, 
not to flood our minds with worry or raise our blood pressure watching upsetting news or surrender ourselves to discouragement. May we follow urges to call others to reach out to someone who might be more isolated or just needs a special friend to demonstrate care. When we are tired of wearing masks and avoiding invisible germs, keep us actively loving our neighbors by protecting them, even if we would prefer to throw caution to the wind. Help us remain curious learners, always resilient enough to begin again. Keep us on alert throughout the day for holy encounters with transformative power. Embolden us through your resurrection to hold on to hope in the unseen and to claim your purpose for our lives at this propitious moment in history. Renew us day by day to live selflessly in a needy world, spreading love, hope, and joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, Sybil will play the benediction, Go Down in Peace, and we will show you the lyrics to make it easy for you to sing along. by day as you faithfully follow Christ, sharing love, hope, and joy. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and those you love and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen.